We are in a series titled, This Is Us. Who's been with me on any part of the series? Just raise your hand if you've been here. Great, so for those who haven't, I just wanna catch you up on where we are. We're saying this is who we are as a church, and I think it's been really informative for a lot of people. So I'm gonna take five to give you an overview of the last two weeks for those who have not been here before we get started with part three. We started with this word, what in the world does it mean to be a Christian? Um, Christian, it's this idea that unfortunately is undefined and it's undefined so you can actually make it mean anything you want it to mean. You can make the word Christian, um, however you want to define it, you get to do that. And the reason is it only appears how many times in scripture? Three, yes. So for those who didn't know that, the word Christian actually only ever appears three times in Scripture. And every time it's used, all three, it's a derogatory term, meaning that it was negative and it was people who were not currently Jesus followers using that term as a mockery and labeling the Jesus followers. And it was never used in a positive way. The problem was that that term picked up steam and there's been many of thing that has happened in the name of Christianity. You can find Christians on both sides of every political issue. You can find Christians on both sides of every financial issue. You can find Christians on both sides of every legal issue and they will all think they're right. And because of that problem right there, we said there's actually another word that is much more defined that we need to follow a word that actually the people that followed Jesus described themselves and Jesus himself described his followers. And that word is simply disciples. Yeah, disciples, that's it. So disciples appears hundreds of times in the New Testament. In fact, it's really hard to get around it. And it has a lot more meaning and a lot more direction. It, it, it honestly has a lot more responsibility attached to it because Jesus said that you are my disciples. And then he said this in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That as long as you're doing that, that if you love one another, we're gonna sum the whole game up of Christianity by saying just love the insiders that you're doing life with and that outsiders would look on and say that's so unique and so different and so attractive. I wanna be a part of that. The way they love one another is so astounding to me. I wanna be friends with somebody that would love me like that friend loves that person. I don't know if I'd ever be one. I don't know if I believe what they believe, but I tell you what, I would love for my daughter to marry one of those people. I don't know if I believe what they believe, but by, by the way they love, I would hire every single one of them because of how loving they are and how they treat people. I don't know if I believe what they believe, but I would work for one because I believe the way that they lead is so loving and so caring that why would I work for anyone else? I think we probably would have had a whole different planet if we all would have followed that one line right there. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, not Christians, disciples. That's a whole different language. And so that's the first command he gave. Well, then we kept studying a bit further and we realized that Jesus had a, a much bigger command because he said like, how cool would it be if we just, if we had a whole movement that broke out where we had people that wanted to be disciples and that, that were on mission for other people to become a disciple. And so he says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I love this, okay? Woo, that's a chair. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. When he said that, he literally sealed every single word he had ever told them. He just covered it. He said, hey, I don't have time to go through everything we talked about over the last three and a half years, teach them to obey everything. Everything means everything that I commanded you and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. You're gonna jack it up. You're gonna put your foot in your mouth. You're gonna try to teach people this. You're gonna try to do this and you're gonna need a lot of grace. So I'm just letting you know, I am with you always through thick and thin. And so when we summed it up, we said really the purpose of the church is to do one thing. Quite simply, we are to make more and better disciples. That's it. 
That's the mission. We want more and better. More because Jesus said, therefore, go and make them. So he said, what we have is not enough. We need more. And then teach them. And everybody knows that the teacher always follows the curriculum better than the student, which means that the ones we have would get better than where we are today. Makes sense? More and better disciples. I don't know what you've been taught about Christianity. That's the only game in town. Making more and better disciples. That's it. So then we ask this question, well, what about those people who don't look like us that like they weren't disciples? So if we're making them disciples, that means at one point in time they weren't, but they decided to be. So like, how do we do that? And what does that look like? It's a good question. And I took you to Luke 15 and Luke 15, Jesus tells this story to a group of shepherds because they kind of knew what the metaphor would mean. And he said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? Great question. Then he says, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, listen to this, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And so he used the metaphor and he said, therefore go, make disciples, and teach them everything I commanded you. So he was referencing this. And he said, so all those outsiders who are not currently disciples, I want to mobilize you to be in relationship with people who don't think like you think, don't believe what you believe, don't behave how you behave. And let me tell you, that's okay. In fact, that's not just okay. He would say that's the mission that we want to end the 99, creating two camps of people, that they're the 99 who are disciples, who are followers of Jesus. That those would go and create intentional relationship with those who do not follow Jesus. Those would just be labeled the one. They don't currently follow Jesus. And so I want to pause for the cause of this message before we go any further and say this, that at this point, sometimes as we're sitting in a group, it can feel sort of awkward to create two groups of people and say, so are you saying like, you know, you're identifying that there are lost people and all this, and you're like, teaching people to get in relationship with them. Like, what does that even mean? I am over here. This is awkward to me. This feels funny to me. Here's what I would say. At this church, you can belong before you believe. At this church, you can still have community. We're commanded to love one another. So we're in on this thing together. So you can belong inside of all this. And here's what I would say even further than that is, look at what happened over the last century. We divided the two groups and we said, let's just hang out over here and let's just have relationship with only people who look like us and think like us and behave like us and believe like us. And then there was this tone deaf radio silence gap between the two. And I'm saying, well, what would we rather have? Wouldn't we want to teach people to create relationship with one another in a healthy, real way, an intentional relationship where we can bridge the gap between the two? By the way, I didn't say it. Jesus said it, and I'm just the messenger. And so I'm saying, wouldn't that be better to show people that we can love each other, that we can reach one another, that we can actually have relationships with them? So here's the other thing that I would say about this. If if you're identified self as like the one and you're like, yeah, that's me. Uh, we have room for you and space for you and we welcome you and we, we hold you here. However, if you're in the 99, you're thinking like, why are we talking about this? Here's what I'd say. It's summertime in the South. They're not here. They're on Lake Murray right now. They're drinking a Bloody Mary, you know, nursing, nursing it from last night. Okay, some of y'all, that's just a joke, okay? Like, you might be in the one, and that's you. You were using the Bloody Mary yesterday because Friday night was good, you know what I'm saying? 
My point is simply, I think it's okay to talk like this and create space like this and to just call the elephant out that might be in people's minds, address it, move on, and say, this is us. This is where we're headed as a church. So I left you with a question last week was this. Who is your one? And that was all I wanted you to do was just think about the people in your life who are far from God that you can intentionally invest in and have a relationship with. Well, as I approached this series, I knew that I wanted to just do that last week, and then this week I want to talk about practically how do you create relationship with the one. And I wanted to bring up my best friend to help me have this conversation with you. His name's Preston Ulmer. Preston and I have been friends for almost a decade now. He planted a church in Denver, Colorado. And when he planted a church in Denver, he started this movement called the Doubters Club, and he epitomizes this idea. He was a pastor and a Christian who befriended an atheist, and they started a club together called the Doubters Club. And they met in coffee shops, and they met in bars, and they hung out with one another, and Buddhists were attracted to it, and agnostics were attracted to it, and swingers and cross-dressers, and anybody that you might could think of that would be like the one, and what you might label as way out there. They were all attracted to it, and he started befriending people. Well, people started picking up on this idea, and the first one that was launched in 2015 is not the only one that exists in 2021. There are over 60 doubter clubs nationwide all over the country, and universities are now calling him saying, we want this on our university campus because what we're seeing you do is actually unify around some amount of diversity. By the way, that's the history on the word university, that we could still be unified even if we disagree. And that sounds a lot like the 99 being in relationship with the one. Well, it got so um, impressive and large that uh, he decided, I probably need to write some things down about what we're doing. And so Preston is releasing a book this fall called The Doubters Club. Uh, It got picked up and he already has another contract on a second book that's amazing. But this book is, um, you know, the early bird gets the worm. This doesn't come out till September. That's the only worm right there. That's it. There ain't no other book. So he doesn't have these to hand out today. We're just good friends with the guy. And so I invited him to come and, uh, and share some stuff from the book as we talk about this together. He now lives in Springfield, Missouri, where he helps church planters like us plant healthy churches in every community working for the Church Multiplication Network. And he was actually here on launch Sunday, which was September 20th of last year. He has a beautiful wife and two girls, and he is just one of my dearest, best friends, and he's going to join me as we talk about how to have relationship with the one in practical ways. Would you get up on your feet? Would you put your hands together and give a big shout for my friend, Preston Ulmer? Ready? Good morning. Man, I tell you what. If you can just give everyone an introduction in their life, Pastor Allen makes me sound way cooler than I am. So when you write books, it's easy. You know, you say that and everybody's like, okay, yeah. all right. Well, well, we'll see. It's released in September. We'll see what they say after reading it. Hey, it's great. It's great to be here. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm here. Man, we're excited. We're excited. Um, so we picked this up. You know, we just started talking last night after I picked you up. You know, from oh, we've been talking. Well, as I mean, we've been talking for like a long years. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Messing with my iPad here, trying to get settled. So, this book, as you've been, I mean, you're very comfortable in these spaces. Like, you're the best I know that sits in conversations with people who look differently, think differently, believe differently, believe the opposite, actually. And you've befriended people of every walk of life with every type of worldview there is, um, you just, you've done a great job at doing that. But here's what I want to ask. When you came to the table to write the book, the book wasn't what you were going after. It was the club itself, the real-time relationship, which is perfect, by the way, for where we are as a church. But I want to ask, what, what did you feel was missing from the conversation of people who are churched or saved or in the 99 as we would call it and in them trying to have authentic relationship with people who are not saved or 
not followers of Jesus or the one, as we would call it, what did you feel like you could add to the conversation that was missing before you wrote that book? Yeah, well, there's not, I don't know if you've been to a bookstore lately, there's not a lack of books on evangelism, right? Or uh, how to share your faith and those sort of things. So I, in, in that, I'm like, well, I think the conversation is, it, it's lacking because the, the goal of a lot of books or a lot of talks on evangelism yeah. is how do I share my faith, right? Like that's what people ask. How do I share, teach me how to share my faith. So, well, I think it's more about sharing your life and that's not just a difference. That's not like a slight nuance. That, I'm, I'm, that's a whole different paradigm. Yeah. That I think it's about sharing your life to d- the degree that you're willing to give it away for the sake of the person who doesn't think like you. Sharing your faith, it, it's the difference of this. Like, Jesus wasn't friendly to sinners. He was a friend of sinners, right? And, that's good. And for us, we're like, hey, I've, I've been really friendly with the person who doesn't think like me. We had a whole, uh, like, discussion last night with my neighbor, and it was awesome. Way to be friendly, but I think the whole thing is like, be friend of. And um, so I think what has been missing in my life until Doubters Club was, man, what if, what if I just actually did life with these people? Hmm. Like, for real, they're, they're my people. And so I, I haven't always been comfortable in those spaces, but when you get comfortable in those spaces, then you get uncomfortable in church spaces. You see? And right. It's like, so um, I think that's what was missing yeah. is this idea. And, and by the way, I'll say this. If you notice in the Bible, I, I'm having trouble finding it. Maybe you can find it and show me. But I just can't find where Jesus is like, go convert the world. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Where he's like, hey, uh, I, want, I want everyone to think like you. But we see two pretty clear commands that would kind of encapsulate that. One is go make disciples, right? right? So you're making something. That takes a while, right? It takes a while to make something. And the other one is, in as much as it's possible with, with you, be reconcilers of all people. And so I, I think that we forget there's a bridge to be built from my heart to yours. Yep. Atheist Allen, okay? Atheist if that was, Allen. <laughs> but there's a bridge to be built. Yeah. And Jesus will walk across that bridge and do what he will. That's called reconciliation, and I think that's missing from our conversations. You know, we didn't say this in the last service. We had a good conversation, but we actually— This service will be better than the last yeah, service. Yeah, that's right. right? You, you, you get, you okay, get round so you two. Know. You know, the pump's been primed. It's all good now. But what we did not say that I feel like is a critical piece of your story is you were not always a Jesus follower. Now, yes. that sounds like, well, weren't at some point we all not a Jesus follower? Yeah, but Preston's story is unique because you were actually an atheist at one yeah, point. I completely left the faith. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, in Bible college, by the way, how, how weird is that? I don't blame the Bible college. I still, I, I still paid them, right? Everything's right, fine. Right. But, but in Bible college, I had all these questions, and I had well-meaning people yeah. telling me the worst advice, like sleep on the Bible. And I, I don't know if it's because I used... ESV and not NIV. I don't Man. know what happened, okay? But Osmosis? It doesn't work. <laughs> just gives you a crick in your neck. And, and, and so I had that. I had people say, listen to wor- more worship music, which if you're an unbeliever and you have Hillsong playing in the background, there's nothing more frustrating than that. <laughs> but then I had someone who said, hey, as a philosophy professor said, hey, I don't care where you land as long as you're honest. And he committed to me. Wow. on this journey. So yeah, so that, uh, I mean, showing my cards, yeah. I, I do have a bias towards this type of discipleship. Sure, sure. But that's what led you back to the faith. That's right. Correct. Was a particular individual who said, it's not just that I'm going to share my faith with you. I'm going to share my life with you. My life. And that relationship actually did what we just read in Luke 15. He led you back to the 99. That's right. And, and now we had 100. Yes, so as we were talking and we were coming to the table, you said, I think we need to actually go to Luke 14, the chapter right before the one we just read, you know, and just share some stuff from that because it sets up Luke 15 yeah. in, in exactly like the scriptural reference you use of why you wrote the book. So Luke, well, I will say this. I watched your sermon last week. It's yeah. really good. He's really good. Oh. He's a great preacher. Uh, Come make me so, shy. So I wasn't saying, I wasn't saying... You shouldn't have done Luke. Oh 15. no, Luke fifteen is is what we get the why for it, right? Yeah. But then we're like, hey, what? How did Luke set the story up? Like, how That's did he good. do it? 
Well, in Luke 14, Jesus tells a parable. Now, now let me just say something. When you read a parable of Jesus or a story of Jesus, if it settles really well with you, if you're like, oh, I, I love that, you're, you're probably not reading it in context because this got him killed. Like, this stuff he talked about was so offensive, he had to go to a cross, okay? So in Luke 14, he's sitting together with a bunch of religious people. It's like a potluck, right? It's like, who, who brought the potato salad, right? Uh, and, and Jesus and all, all, all religious people, and he's sitting down, and they're all kind of like move, bumping elbows, trying to s- sit next to him or to sit as close as they can to the person of honor. And he goes, hey, I want to tell you a story. He goes, I want to talk to you about what type of party God throws, right? Like what kind of dinner party he throws. And he tells a story, and the story kind of goes like this. He said, there's a master who had prepared the banquet and uh, got the food ready and all this stuff. And then the master sends out a servant and says, hey, go get the people who would say yes, like the religious people. Go get the people who know there's an invitation at the table. And they give three different excuses, which aren't important for what we're talking about, but they give excuses, and then we'll jump in. Let's jump in. Right there? Right there, yeah, Okay, yeah. Luke 14, we're going verse 21 through 24. 24. Yeah. So if you have your iPhones, what did oh, you say last? What did you, know, you say? Yeah, yeah, this is a good. Look, if you have an iPhone, you simultaneously have something called the Notes app. If you have Android, I don't know what the devil put in that, but um, whatever the alternative equivalent it's green. is. green. Whatever it is, is green. Is Every it? time I message someone with an Android, I'm like, you ruined our group message. <laughs> oh, man. So it's a green something. <laughs> Hashtag join the iPhone club. Um, so if you would, I really think what we're about to do is establish the how yeah. that you create healthy relationships intentionally, okay, over the next 20 plus minutes on how, we're, gonna, we're just gonna give you some practical things. I'm learning a ton in this process too, and I just think it'd be super beneficial for you to take notes on this. Yeah. You, can, you can copy paste Luke, you know, 14, 21 through 24, stick it in the search engine and, you know, yeah. pull that over. But yeah, let's, you're gonna wanna take notes on this because you're gonna need it next week when you're like there's our neighbor what do we do now do you know jesus no don't do that we're gonna we're gonna jesus love you (laughs) we're gonna teach you how to share your life which by the way should liberate you should you might leave today going oh jesus set me free in this area today so good so okay let's do luke chapter 14 remember he's telling this story with a bunch of religious people and he goes the servant came back and reported this to the master That, you know, they had excuses. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room, right? Like, you remember that Beastie Boys song, you got to fight for your right to party? Okay, he's like, we've been fighting for our right. We're hungry, okay, let's party. And he goes, then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. The, the roads and the country lanes, by the way, led to the edges of the cliff, right, in, in, in this area. And who we know lived on the edge of the cliff, there's a story about a demon-possessed man. There's a crazy story. The demons go into some pigs, and, and you got to read it for yourself. But we just know the edge of the cliff, the God-haters were there. They wanted to be as far from anything religious, both emotionally and spiritually, as they could. And he said, I want you to go there and compel them. Like, compel them. Yeah. So here's what's interesting about the word compel. If you're here and you're not like a normal churchgoer, or you're not a Jesus follower, and you go, "Uh, I know what it's like to be compelled. I I actually, I know what it's like to grow up and, and my mom or dad... I don't, I'm saying this is your story, and you're like, I know what it's like to get like spanked if I don't get in the car to go to church. I know it's like, like the, I was compelled. You're not alone, because this word has been abused, full disclosure, all throughout church's history. Like during the Spanish Inquisition, mostly in the 1500s, you know, that thing went on for a few hundred years, but mostly in the 1500s, we know on the inside of shields was written the phrase, compel them. And so they would give threat of death, separation from family, these sorts of things, that if you don't confess Christ, we will compel you to confess Christ. This word has been abused and is probably more abused now in a more subtle way, like if you don't become a Christian, then we're just not friends, right? 
because I'm trying to compel you. Our friendship's on the line. Well, here's the reality. This is so important. The master, if he wanted them to be manipulated and forced and all stuff, he would have sent out a soldier. It would have said, and then he sent out his soldier. But it says he sent out his servant. Isn't that amazing? And the word compel there is super unique to the New Testament. Uh, It means insistent hospitality over an extended period of time. Like that God's going, hey, the, the food's going to get cold, but I'd rather the food get cold than for you to be here by yourself. Wow. Go do life with them. Gosh, there's just so much there. My mind's racing. I mean, so when we take Matthew 28 and it says, and go make disciples, yeah. and you define compel with, uh, what'd you say? Insistent, Insistent. hospitality. Yeah. Over, over an extended period of time. That's the, that's the actual definition. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you compare that with, you know, trying to, I always say this, close the deal. You know, like we're, yeah. we're salesmen, you know, and we're trying to close the deal on somebody who doesn't know Jesus as fast as possible. Yeah. Jesus actually taught the opposite of that. Right. He I, said, just share your life. Don't you think if it would have worked by just sharing the truth that Jesus would have done it? Like, don't you think he would have, like, assembled? I mean, he called fish into a net, right? He can get people. He can gather people. Don't you think he would have been like, and here's the faith. And everybody, hoorah, and the world's changed. Wow. But he's like, it's going to take me giving my life for, like, 11 of you, 12, one of them, you know, whatever. (laughs) But it's going to take, it's going to take my life giving my, I got to get myself to 12. (laughs) Right. I think that is an important distinction, too, that, you know, it doesn't always work. It, 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 that even Jesus didn't, didn't get them all, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't the ones he did life with, right. There was still somebody who, who wasn't for it, but he did it anyway. Yeah. 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 It's not, I I don't think the Judas story is there to tell us, Hey, this might happen to you. And I think it's there to be like, this will happen to you. And then Paul writes in the new Testament about, you're going to experience the glory of God only if you participate in the suffering of Christ. Wow. And you're like, oh, no. Yeah. That means, yeah, that means you're going to give your life to people who want to take it. That's what that means. Man. Um, but that's what he did. But that's what he did. Right. And what you're saying is, like, after the word compel, which I thought was really good, if, if, if Christ would have wanted to change it to mean more forced and more manipulative, he would have sent soldiers. Correct but he sent servants to serve people and to love people. And in the process of that, that actually worked. Now we, we yeah. manipulated it, but it, but yeah, it yeah. worked. Yeah. It, yeah. But then the, the, the clause right after that is so that my house will be full. That's right. So he's looking for, you know, cause he says there's even more room. There's more That's room right. for, for one more person. There's, we still have seat at the table yeah. And so you're saying, and I think we're in alignment on this here too, is Luke 15. I was reading it that he rejoices when one comes into the 99. He throws a party. He yeah. rejoices. We're saying he doesn't throw the party yet until, until yeah. the one comes. Yeah, you could. Th- there's a party, but like it's going to be awkward if you just show up. Let, let me say this before we get into the how-to, yeah. which I'll tell you this too. This is pretty funny. It just shows how my, my hearing has changed over the years. When you're like, I think we agree on this. In, in Doubters Club settings, that never happens. They're like, I know we disagree. And I'm like, oh, we agree. We're having a conversation we agree on. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's strange to me. So uh, that's let, funny. let me say this before we get into the how-to. I think that, uh, remember we were talking about Toy Story yeah. uh, yesterday? Do this part. Okay. I like this part. So I don't know what you did during the pandemic. And, uh, and maybe you've talked to Jesus about what you did. You probably should. But wh- one of the things that... <laughs> One of the things we did that was, was so loaded. That was just, listen, that was just hey, like out there. Hey, listen, I, I don't know. You don't need to answer. But what I'm saying is what we did was we watched a lot of Disney Plus with our kids, okay? Yeah. And uh, in fact, if you can claim it on child care for taxes, w- we probably could. One of the movies that we went back and watched was Toy Story. You guys ever, please, you've seen Toy Story? The first yeah, one. Yeah, let's okay. see. I don't know if you've seen like Toy Story 7, but the first one is the one I'm talking about. Yeah. In the first one, if, 
if Disney Pixar was ever to do a movie on Luke 14 and 15, by the way, uh, I, they already did on Toy Story. So here's what happens. Woody, remember Woody? It, it, he's like the, the cowboy, the sheriff, and he's Andy's favorite toy. So let's call the, all those toys the 99, right? And, and Woody's there. He has Andy inscribed on his foot, just like you guys have the name. Some of you have the name Jesus on your arm and a tattoo. Great. You know, like, just like Woody, until Buzz comes in. And Buzz is the outsider who doesn't believe the truth, by the way, right? Buzz goes, I'm a space ranger. I'm not a toy. I'm a space ranger. He starts to influence them, and Woody gets upset. And then they, Woody has to be with Buzz, and, and he gets so mad. He's on this detour of life with Buzz. He gets so mad that he yells at him, you are a toy, right? You're a child's plaything. And, uh, and then Buzz responds with, you are a sad, strange little man, <laughs> and you have my pity. And then he says, I can't, farewell, right? He does the farewell yeah. thing, walks away. And it's this picture of, you don't believe the truth. You're, 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 it's hard to do life with you. You don't think like me. And guess what the world does? You are a sad, strange little Christian, wow. and you have my pity. And then here's what Woody knows. And if you watch the movie, you'll, you'll remember this. Andy doesn't want Woody to return without Buzz. In fact, if Woody goes home to Andy, it's just not the same now. Like, Andy's heart is for Buzz. That's where his heart is, and for them to return together. So in the process, Woody's whole heart changes. He's like, I actually don't want to go home without you, Buzz. Right? Like, there's opportunities he could have. His heart changes that he's like, no, no, I got to go home with Buzz. Why? Because I love him. Like, Buzz is, is the best part of my life right now. And then Buzz does end up changing his, his whole worldview, and it crashes. And what does Woody do? He's there with him, and then they return. And I just go, listen, I think what Jesus is saying is, you can't come home without Buzz. I, I don't throw parties because you got irritated and frustrated. Is that not the greatest illustration of all time? I mean... Like we could just pray right there, and we'll call the, the, the sermon, Come Home with Buzz. In fact, does I have that up there? Is it up there? Yeah, yeah there come it is. back with Buzz, <laughs> and we can just go home. But that is such a galvanizing illustration of us, as we get closer yeah. to the heart of God, we actually, actually get closer yeah. to the hearts of people who aren't with him. Yes, the closer you get to God, yeah. the closer you should get to the skeptic, the doubter, the spiritually wounded. Yeah. I mean, that's how it works. Right. And the further you get from the heart of God, the further you get from all the rest. Wow. That's just what he means by disciples making disciples. Man. And that's when the house is full, when, yep. when Buzz comes home. Yep. And Andy's excited, and they, they fly in through the, the, yeah. the, 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 the uh, sunroof. With the firework on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great they 4th of July movie. The, yeah. yeah, it's a good 4th yeah. of July movie. Come to church next week. There you okay? go. Yeah. With Buzz. Yeah. With Buzz. Yeah. Just kidding. We're... Okay, so, okay, so here's the deal. I think we've done a great job illustrating the why on this and what you're talking about, like why that's important. I think every single one of us struggle with how. How, how, do I, how do I do this, you know? Like, how do I befriend my neighbor or the guy at the gym that I see every day or, or the parents that are at the soccer practice, football practice, wherever, the coworker that I know is, is, is different and all that. If you've ever struggled with creating relationship with somebody who is opposite you in the faith, raise your hand. Just let me see you. You're like, man, this has been tough for me to do that. Okay, yeah, so nobody's really alone in this. Yeah. And again, since you were really the tip of the spear leading something that goes out there and, and says this should be more normal. You created something of how we do that. I rephrased it for you. I said, I think this is the intentional cycle of relationships. Yeah, it's a great, I just, the book's already written, but I will. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, you want to, I'll take royalties. I'll give you my address. <laughs> <Great. Yeah. laughs> um, but you call it the five eyes of relationship. Yeah. And I think it's how we, we do this. Yeah, we, we actually... I think this is where pressure's off. What we did was we just looked at the life of Jesus yeah. and go, okay, what did he do, right? So I, I know what he didn't do. What he didn't do was like just try to tell everyone, here's doctrine number one, and here's doctrine number two, 
and here's why you're wrong, and here's how you can be right. He didn't do that, right? Um, he didn't have the biggest apologetics ministry. In, in fact, I would say this. Jesus wasn't the loudest proclaimer of what he knew to be truth, but he was the busiest doer of what he knew to, knew to be love. That was Jesus. That was good. The, the so, thumb should be firing on that keyboard right there. So I'll say it one more time. Jesus was not the loudest proclaimer of what he knew to be truth, but he was the busiest doer of what he knew to be love. That is so, so good. So then we go, okay, what did he know to be love? This is the five eyes. You can do this at any point with anybody, but you've got to be willing to commit. First one is impression. What's the impression they have of you? And by the way, this is all relationships. All you, relationships. You, you picked apart an autopsy of how relationships work. Yes. And the first with, with whoever. That's right. Yeah. Like this, this can be with anyone in your life. It tends to work really well with people who don't think like you. I love it. Okay. And it's impression. What's their impression of you? The impression people had of Jesus was like, well, the religious people, they thought sinners were the problem. Uh, but Jesus, he thought sinners were the purpose. So, so the religious people were like, we don't really like them, but the non-religious people were like, we love them. They had a great impression of Jesus, yeah. okay? So what's the impression? So have you been telling your neighbor time and time again, hey, we should get together, we should get together, we should get together, and you're like, we're five months in the year, I've been saying it since January? Yeah. Well, you may need to go back and rebuild the impression and say, I'm really sorry. I, I, can we do Tuesday? Right? There is an impression piece that just by default of being Christian, we're not the most likable people in the world because people have baggage. So that's the first one. Yeah. Start there if you have a bad impression. Number two, intention. Like what's the intention in the relationship? Okay. This is the conversation we'll have when a guy wants to marry our daughters and then, you What's know, your intention with her? Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is a little different than that one. This yeah. one is like, your, this is for you, okay? For you, are you still in the relationship if they never think like you? What if they never become a Jesus follower? Are you out or are you in? The difference would be between an ulterior motive and an ultimate motive. An ultimate motive, I tell people in doubters clubs all the time, I, ultimately, I want everybody to be with God forever. Yeah. And I want to be with you forever. Like, I, I, I want that. That's, that's my worldview. I hope I don't have an ulterior motive. I hope I don't think I'm in this until you do this because we all know how bad it is when people have ulterior motives, right? You thought you made a really good friend and then they try to sell you some oils on Facebook, right? I mean, <laughs> listen. Drop the mic. We're in the South. That's like cardinal <laughs> sin down here. Okay, well, just... There are some essential oil carrying card members in this church. Yes, and I'll buy oils from you after oh. we're friends for a while. Just oh. don't message me after service. Okay, so <laughs> we know what it's, it's so like, good. okay, when your motives are off. I, I just want to let you know, I've been told time and time again, I cannot go to the Doubters Club because I don't believe there's a gathering that's not trying to convert people by Christians. And I go, you're probably right. You've never experienced that. So your intention is really important. Okay, those are the first two. The third one is invitation. Invite them into life. Like, invite them into the natural rhythms of your life. What, what's the natural rhythm of your life? What do you do? I mean, you got to eat. You might go to coffee. What's a natural, maybe your coworker needs a ride to work. What's a natural rhythm or ask them a natural rhythm of theirs and get involved in it, okay? Imagine how weird it is, though, by the way, if you're like, I want to do life with you, and they're like, I don't like you, <laughs> right? right? The impression's off. Yeah. Or they're like, I, yeah. I know your intention. You're just wanting me to pray the prayer, right? It, it does work kind of linearly like this. Okay, here's the fourth one. Initiation. This is not the initiation you went through back in 1980-whatever, okay? <laughs> this is initiation. The question is, how do we initiate conversations that matter? Yeah. I, I want to let you know, when we do Doubters Club trainings... This one's hard for people. And I, and I try to be really clear. If you think it's awkward to initiate a conversation that's meaningful, it's actually awkward to not initiate a conversation that's meaningful. If you call someone your friend, but you've never had an intentional conversation with them, they're not your friend. Yeah. Right? You're friendly to them. I mean, listen, Pastor Ellen and I have been like best friends for, I don't know, seven, eight years. Yeah. Yeah. We have had intentional conversations. 
100%. You know what would ruin our friendship? If it was constantly, how's the weather? Yeah. I like this sports team. Right? Yeah. That's where it gets weird. So there's ways you can do this. You know, I ask people, what's a book that shaped your life? And then I say, I'm going to read that book. Let's talk about it next time we're together. And then I want to tell you a book that shaped my life. And then I tell them the Bible. I don't tell them the Bible. I'm just kidding. I, I, we, and then we go back and forth, back and forth and yeah. as we're moving towards Jesus. And I love that one because I, I, I know that the first three are, are, are maybe they're, they're not given. They're not really assumed. Right. But this one, I think, requires a little practicality of how you actually initiate meaningful yes. conversations. So as you've done this with people of all walks of life and backgrounds, what are some questions or some conversation starters that you yeah. give to those who are like, I'd love to try this. I just don't even know what's the first thing I need to ask. Maybe an example of something that you go, here's a good place to start. So I realized when we talked about this last service, we actually do have conversation starters online. I have a whole PDF, so I'll send to oh, you. You can send perfect. to the whole church. Okay? Yeah, that's great. So, but one of the things that we try to tell people to do, uh, and you got to imagine when you're talking about the one, who's the one in your mind that you're thinking of right now, okay? And even if you are the one, by the way, do this, right? And so yeah. we tell them, sit down, get a hot cup of coffee, and ask the person, tell me your story around this topic. And it's got to be the topic that you two disagree on. And all you're going to do for a whole cup of coffee is listen and ask questions. That's all you're going to do. That's great. And you're going to want to give a rebuttal, and you're going to want to say, no, that's not right. Well, it, here's the deal. If you're like, I'm, it's compromising. If you listen, it's compromising. No, if you talk all the time, it's compromising. I think that's all throughout Scripture, right? Yeah. Listening, neurologically, listening is the number one fastest way to gain trust. That's how the brain works. Wow. And don't get a cold cup of coffee. Get like extra hot latte. Okay? 160 degrees. That's right. Holy yeah. Spirit will burn your throat if you try to go through fa That's too right. fast. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just, just ask around that topic. So it, what is it? Sexuality? Is it politics? Go tell me your story around this. I want to listen. And guess what people want more than anything? To be listened to. Right? That's, that would be like where I would say try that. Yeah, that's so good. Because then, then there's no pressure to really respond with anything that's, that's, that's what we would consider right. right. We know that that's just, you we're just giving people space to tell their side of the story. And you're going to, instead of giving them an answer, here's what you'll learn. And it's what, what, do you, what do you learn about Buzz? There's a whole story as to why they think the way they think. Right. Right? Nobody's created beliefs in a vacuum. So for you, you're like, no, I'm right. Well, guess what? They think they're right too. And you know what's really important in those moments? What story developed their thinking? Right. So then they go, oh, well, this is what happened to my parents. And here's what happened in a church I grew up in. And here's what happened. And you start to go, oh, this makes so much sense. It actually gives so you much sense. a window of compassion into where they're at in the story. And you're like, I may have done the same thing you did if I were in your shoes. 100%. Right. So those are the first four, okay? And, and you, now here's the fifth one. Remember Pastor Allen last week talked about, I watched the sermon, right? It, yeah, uh, yeah. You talked about the Ingle scale. You That's talked right. about the positive side and the negative side, that if you're following Jesus, you're on the positive side, yep. and if you're not interested or not following, you're on the negative side. Well, the last I you may think is immersion, right? Baptism, dip them in the tank, right? Whatever right. you want to say. Yeah. But that's the positive side of the scale. Yeah. The last one's actually imitation, right? Where Paul says, imitate me, follow me as I follow Christ, right? Yeah. There's this idea that invite them on Jesus' mission. What we know is that missional living stirs affections more than knowledge does. We know that. Yeah. Just statistically, it's true. Invite them in. And, and that, that's why church plants are full of people serving who don't believe in Jesus. Right. And it's incredible when you invite them in. So we have yet, in all the doubters clubs we launched, nobody has, no atheist has said no to co-moderating a doubters club. Wow. Because it's like, hey, yeah, of course, there's something in our heart that wants to live on mission. So whatever I you're at right now, pressure is off. Just move to the next one. That's it. Just do that. That's, that's all. I mean, uh, I'll tell you, if, if like someone who doesn't think like me 
did this with me, I'd go, oh, I'm totally in this relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to note in all of this that it's, it, we, a lot of us might be accustomed to the verse, it's, it's grace and truth, you know, right. grace and truth that's fused together. And there's one I like to throw in there that I think we don't think about. It's grace and truth plus time. Right. That right. time right. spent develops those relationships. That's right. That we're looking for. That's right. Yeah. So I feel like it'd be good to just, just like casually bring up some rebuttals that some of us might have to this whole process. Because I think all of us are wondering, you know, like, I got some questions though, when I'm doing relationship with somebody who right. I know is so different in all of this question that I've had before and still have, you know, to this day, what if they ask a question and I don't know the answer? Yeah. Anybody ever thought that? Like, you feel ill-equipped and they're like, what about the cross-cultural context of the ancient Near East and the fellowship of all the Council of the Jerusalem believers? And you're like, oh, oh God. <laughs> you know? Come to church with me, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I know everybody feels the pressure to have the right answers to people's questions. And right. what would you say to that? Well, I... Uh, I would ask, first of all, is that working? Does have the right, having the right answer, is that working? Right? When my wife, which she does have the right answer to most things, okay? If you're watching, honey, I, you right. do. Yeah. But she do, it, it doesn't actually change me, right? If anything, if you get in a heated discussion, the right answer irks you, mm. right? You don't need the right answer. Like, no, nowhere in what Jesus was talking to us about does he say you need the right answer, you need, like, the right commitment. That's what you need. So when it comes to what do I, like, do I know the right answer? Let's say you're talking to someone and they say, what about the Old Testament? Like, it seems like God just is killing everybody in the Old Testament. And, and why does he do that? And you're like, that's why I don't read the Old Testament. And here, here's what I say. If you don't know and you haven't developed a humble answer, I would say, I don't know. But that's a really good question. Can we find out together? Why, why would I want to find out the answer to life's questions by myself, right? It, once you find the answer, you know the first thing we do? Bro, did you know? Yeah. Like, hey, did you good. know? Yeah. Like, this is amazing. This has brought life to me. Well, how about we just bring people on the journey? Yeah. So how about we go, I don't know, but we can find out. If God is truth, you have nothing to worry about. If God's not truth, we've got everything to worry about, right? Right, yeah. That's what we call a cult. But if God right. is truth, yeah. we don't have anything to worry about. So that's what I'd say is do it together. Yeah. Find the answer together. Man, that's liberating because the pressure's off, you know? Yeah. To respond the right way at the right time with the right thing and the right tone. And if you don't do it right, then it's over. You know, like, yeah. well, light that one on fire. Start over. New yeah. impression. Ah, new intention. Great. <laughs> yeah. Here I go. Right? Right. Okay, so um, I, I know that everybody's busy. I think that's the American word. Busy. I'm just mm. busy. I'm busy. What about when you come home, you're tired, you're exhausted, you've worked a long day, and you just, you just want to turn Netflix on and veg out. You don't even want to deal with your kids. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I mean, you're just, you're done, you know? And you're going, man, the last thing I want to do is entertain that person at the gym, my coworker, the soccer practice. The last thing I want to do yeah. is be intentional with someone who we would say that they're the one. Right. So in that scenario, how do you, what, what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you help in that scenario of feeling that way in life? Well, this. This one, this hurts, okay? So I'll just let you know, like, the answer to that question hurts. Mm. It, first of all, God knew you would need these kind of days. So he's like, how about you do that once a week and we call it the Sabbath, okay? Yeah. So it's actually all throughout the Bible yeah. that God's going, do it. Rest, 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 rest. Yeah. And then he goes, I even did it, <laughs> right? So if you're not taking advantage of it, do that, try it his way, and then see, see if it works. It usually does. But then the other, the other thing is, if you are doing that all the time, right? like if that's your default, and you go, I just don't have time, or I don't have the attention, I don't have the mental space, I don't have all this stuff, you're just probably not close to Jesus. Like as far as being a disciple of Jesus, right. 
you're probably not following him because he's on mission. He gives you the energy of the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things. And if you're not, so while you're wasting your time, their time's running out. Yeah. And yeah. you can have your days, but this is why it's really important what you're emphasizing. We're not saying do this with all your neighbors. <laughs> right. Saying, hey, what if you did this with one person? Well, right. guess what? They got a schedule too, and they're busy too. And you be intentional. That's why natural rhythms of life is what we're talking about. But I'm just telling you, if you do that all the, if you're like, I got to rest, I got to watch Netflix, I want to talk to this person, that's called lazy, okay? You probably will lose your job. You probably will lose your job on the way to right. this. Um, but you're also going to lose your friends. Yep. So. Uh, so this one we didn't ask last time, and I want to ask it this time. And by the way, again. Well, my plane's leaving, so I will go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, yeah, here we go. You're like, I don't want to do it. And for those who are, again, still there, I know we're talking in, in two worlds right now, and, and maybe you're on this side of, of, of the coin of, like, I'm not a Jesus follower and all those things. Again, you belong. We're, we're just having healthy conversations around how people can have healthy relationships. Well, and you know what they might be thinking is, like, yeah. I, I would be in if that happened. Oh, that's good. Like, yeah. I wish that was the case. So, anyways, go ahead. So, I want to take it in a direction. What happens if the one doesn't want me? Like the emotional, the, the, the hurtful side. What happens if the person that you're, you've identified and you're, you're working through the process and you feel, you feel the, the rejection yeah. of this and you're walking it through? Because I think some of us might be at that space. They might be in the fourth eye, you know. Uh, they may have even seen some of the fifth eye. Like, okay, I see some reciprocal behavior. They, they, look, they look the part. They right. feel like Jesus, right? But there's been some severance or there's been some hurt. What do you do in that way when, that's the, the way I phrase it, is when the one doesn't want me from everyone's individual perspective? So, listen, I'd be the first to say I've experienced, I'm experiencing that, okay? Yeah. I'm experiencing that. It's important that you say, is it me that they don't want or is it the way I'm presenting the gospel and what I'm saying about the gospel that they don't want? So let's be really clear there, right? Yeah. There's some people that are like, I don't know, I was trying to talk to my son or daughter about this topic, and every time I talk, they shut down. Well, they're not, it's not you they don't want, it's the way you're talking to them that they don't want. So mm -hmm. we've got to be clear, right? That's why impression, you got to start there. But let's say that someone's like, I just don't want you. Yeah. It, it happened to Jesus, right? We know it happened to Jesus. Like, <laughs> He, he knew what was going to go down, and it happened to him. So you do have company there, and that's not on you. So you, you can give, at, at that point, you put your attention on someone else. We could say it this way. And we talked about this last night, but um, not this specifically, but I'd say it this way. It, you can give yourself away to this person, but there's a certain time where you just stop, and you go, I'm always here, though right? Like, I'm always willing to give myself to you, but I'm going to stop giving myself to you. But I'm always here because they have to opt in too. So at that point, if you're like, they just want nothing to do with me, okay, then pray for them and, and you did everything you could. Yeah. And as much as it's possible for you is what the scripture said. Yeah. And some people it's impossible. Yeah. So. And I want to, I want to end on a high note with this really. So that's, that's some things that we struggle with. But let's just say it works. Yeah. What if what this process is, what if it actually worked and somebody who was in the 99 befriended somebody in the one and they actually came all the way back home? Yeah. Is there a, well, an answer to that where you've had a story, you know, in sure. this process of like what that looks like? If it works... Write a review for the book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, here, here's what happens. I, I there's, there are stories of it working and time and time again. Now, I'll say this. There's no such thing as a foolproof method, right? If there was, it would have worked for Jesus, and it didn't work, yeah. okay? Yeah. It didn't work for 100% of the people. So uh, I'll say this. When it works, it's beautiful. I, I remember um, there was a guy that was coming to the Doubters Club with his girlfriend, and he was a Satanist and had the tattoos to prove it. I mean, this is... He, this is him. And then he would come up to me and be like, hey, this is actually our church. And I'm like, we are not a Satanist church. Okay, we are not. Doubters clubs are not churches. 
I, I mean, we were the first ones that they told that they're pregnant. They're just so excited. And, and I, remember, um, I remember almost giving up because, you know, that's, that's the question. And it's really you've got to be led by the Lord here because you're going, I, there's no formula to when do you stop. When, and I remember we would eat, it was about every Thursday or every other, th- other Thursday, we would have a tofu meal together. Okay, I don't, I don't eat tofu. I mean, but to the Jew, you're a Jew. To the vegan, you're a vegan. Okay, so you just, I'm, we're eating tofu together, and it's two days before this meeting. I've been doing this for eight months, praying for him every day. And I tell my wife, we're laying in bed, and I said, we're talking about our week, and I said, hey, I, I'm just, I'm done meeting with him. I'm just going to stop. He can come to the Doubters Club if he wants. I, I'd like, I feel like this is going nowhere. You know, like the impression's on. Also, we're talking about things that matter. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just so tired. And she goes, what if our, our daughter's names are Piper and Brennan? What if Piper and Brennan became atheists or Satanists? And there was someone who followed Jesus in their neighborhood that hung out with them all the time. What would you do? And I, I remember telling her, I would pay that person's salary to quit their job and hang out with our daughters more, right? And she said, yeah, so you, you're, going, you're going to have tofu in two days. I said, you're right. We go meet. He was in a custody battle. He had, gotten, he had multiple kids with multiple strippers, and um, he was talking about how the time before, how much peace he's lacking, and he tells me, he goes, hey, Preston, I have an incredible amount of peace in my life. And I go, oh, really? And he goes, yeah, I do. And I said, what do you, like, is that coming from inside you? Is that coming from outside? Where's that coming from? He goes, it's like something I've never experienced before. All the time I have it for like a week. And I told him, I said, you know, I pray for you every day. He goes, yeah, I know. And I said, who do you think's giving you that peace? God or the devil, <laughs> right? And he goes, I think it's God because I've never had it before. And I said, um, who do you think God is? And he said, well, from our discussions, I think God's Jesus. And I, re- I even remember him saying this, I hope he's Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? And I said, well, then what would you like to do? And he said, I need to follow Jesus. And I'm going, oh, eight months? It's a lot, like, exp- the tofu's expensive. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of time. And and when you see it and you go, wait a second, our life together, and you know what I didn't say last time that I wish I said? My heart changed in the process. I have compassion for Satanists. Isn't that weird? Before I was like, they're just kooky, magical people, right? And I'm like, no, no, I like have compassion for them. And so when it works, you just go, yeah, I can, I can live this way and, and you'll be at the table with me. Like we're going to bring Buzz home now. So here's what we want to do. I want to, last week I gave you a lifesaver to end the service. This week there's a second card or yeah, a second card. There was two on your chair when you came in. This one just says, pray for your one. Yeah. And I've wanted to build this, this series out in such a way where you, we could get more intentional and we could lower the blood pressure of everybody but we always wanna underscore what we do with prayer. That Preston's story is that, that, that he prayed for this person for eight months solid. And that's the fuel. You said something last time that prayer breeds commitment to someone and commitment to someone breeds prayer for them. Yeah, you can't have one without the other. Right. right. And so as you pray for the one, you'll notice you get more and more committed to the relationship you have with them. Correct. But as you get more and more committed, you're like, I need to pray. I don't know where to take this anymore. A hundred percent. hundred percent, right? And that's where God's like, yes, like you're doing it. And that's probably why you increase on the angle scale, if you will. You go, you go up in yeah. that because you're like, this, God, I need more of you yeah. in this conversation I'm having with them. Yeah, that's right. But I'm committed to them. I'm not giving up. So on the back of the card, very simple. We just have three lines for you to write the one's name. And if you'll take this out, I wanna do this in real time right here. This card was on every chair when you walked in. If you'll just pull this card out and you can write the person, the person's name on this and maybe even write something that 
you know, God speaks to you about them, maybe an encouraging word of some kind. Uh, maybe there's more than one name on here that you're, you're, you're in relationship with. And this is just a reminder to say, we want to pray for those people. And to close this out as you're writing and you're looking at this and taking it with you, I just want you to pray for us in this moment. I'd be honored. As we go forward and in our sphere, our relational sphere of influence as people do this this week, would you just pray for us as a church that we would help build healthy relationships in this community? Yeah, and I would encourage you, just go to the next I. Okay, wherever you're at, just go to the next one. At a bare minimum, you're going to make a good friend and your heart will change. Maybe not your mind, but your heart will. That's bare minimum, right? That's a good bet. That's so good. That's a good bet. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful that we can think about the times where we've been really far from you. and, And you tell us in your word, it was a joy for the joy set before you you endured the greatest pain possible the cross and i i know we need joy in this process god people are not problems to be fixed god people have purposes and and they are to be pursued and they're to be the ones that go with us when we come to you and so father i just pray for that i pray for patience i pray for the fruit of the spirit in our lives i pray for a, a deep true love long-suffering type of love, a a love that doesn't rejoice in complaining. And and I pray for eyes of faith. Help us to be able to see beyond what is right in front of us. And God, uh, I just ask all these things in your name. Bless Alan and Amanda. Bless their family. Thank you that they live it out. I pray that, uh, that you'd continue to give Pastor Alan creative ways to instill courage into everyone who's listening, watching. And we pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for watching. Head over to vividchurch.com so that you can stay updated with all things Vivid Church. Join us in person or online for one of the services so that you can be a part of our Vivid Church family. But don't stop there. Please share this video so that we can help other people live the vivid story that God has for them. Thank you. Thank you.